I'm Joe Lample. When I created Growing a Greener World, I had one goal, to tell stories of everyday people, innovators, entrepreneurs, forward-thinking leaders, who are all, in ways both big and small, dedicated to organic gardening and farming, lightening our footprint, conserving vital resources, protecting natural habitats, making a tangible difference for us all. They're real, they're passionate, they're all around us. They're the game changers who are literally growing a greener world and inspiring the rest of us to do the same. Growing a greener world, it's more than a movement, it's our mission. New York City is famous for all kinds of things, including its public parks. But you might be surprised to find out that perhaps the most incredible green space of all isn't under your feet, it's over your head. The High Line winds its way through the streets of Manhattan for nearly a mile and a half, but sits 30 feet off the ground. That's because this entire park was repurposed from an abandoned elevated railway. Now it's a fully sustainable landscape that provides a home to nearly half of all the plant species native to the United States, all in an acre and a half of the most densely populated city in America. Once destined for demolition, the High Line has become one of the crown jewels of this city and an environmental rags to riches story that could only happen in New York. Railroads have been a part of Manhattan's west side since the 1840s when street level tracks were used to transport coal, dairy products, and beef around the already booming downtown of New York City. But over time, freight trains became increasingly more dangerous when mixed with the other traffic on the growing city streets. And the idea of an elevated railway was born in 1929 as a safer way to keep the trains rolling overhead. The new High Line Railway cut across city blocks instead of following street lines, going right through the middle of numerous factories and warehouses. This allowed the trains to be unloaded inside the buildings they were serving while never disturbing traffic on the streets below. But by the 1950s and 60s, the trucking industry had exploded and use of the rail line dropped. The last train ran in 1980 and the tracks, although structurally sound, sat unused and abandoned for nearly two decades. And that's when local resident Robert Hammond, a history major who was working in the marketing of startup internet companies, first crossed paths with this forgotten piece of the city's past. I read an article in the New York Times that they were probably going to tear down the High Line. And it had a little map that showed that the High Line was a mile and a half long. Um, I'd seen it in the neighborhood. I lived in the West Village, you know, but I didn't know it was all connected. I didn't know the history. And so I just assumed that everything in New York has a preservation group attached to it. So I thought I could volunteer, maybe help maybe raise money. And so quickly I called around and no one was doing anything. There was no group. So I went to my first community board meeting, I'd never been, been to one. Um, and I sat next to another guy, just coincidentally, that I didn't know. Um, and at, by the end of the meeting we realized no one cared. Either people actively wanted to tear it down or they didn't care at all. And so we started talking. And so we exchanged business cards and said maybe we'll do something together. So that was Joshua David, the other uh, co-founder. And at first our goal was to stop it from being demolished. You know, we didn't know what should happen up on the High Line. You know, there are people that do this and they, they should do it. Um, so we went to the Municipal Art Society, the Architecture League, the American Institute of Architects, a lot of different foundations. Some of them were interested, um, you know, and supportive, but they said, we're not going to do this. You know, and the, the subtext was, this is never going to happen. <laughs> you know, this is such a lost cause. Looking back, it wasn't clear what it was, just because you're going to save it, it wasn't clear what it should become. And so we did an ideas competition, um, and it was open to anyone. You didn't have to be an architect, and you could. The ideas also didn't have to be realistic. So you know, we had 720 entries from 36 countries. It was one of the largest ideas competitions at, at that time. And um, you know, my one of the winners was a mile-long lap pool. There was an urban roller coaster. You know, all these different ideas, and what it helped 
One, it put the project on the map. And the other thing the ideas competition did is help people think differently. You know, instead of, oh, this is a rusty ruin, what, else, what could it become? But for all of his efforts thus far in trying to save the High Line, Robert had never even been on the High Line. He and Joshua arranged for the railroad company to give them a tour so they could see firsthand, for the very first time, what they were trying to save. They gave us this tour and that's when I think we really fell in love with the project. So we went up there and there was a mile and a half of wildflowers in the middle of New York City. And there was incredible tension between hard and soft nature and man-made, you know, the beautiful and the ugly, um, and, you know, sort of progress and decay of the city. And, and that's really what, you know, I fell in love with. Robert and Josh took some photos of what they saw that day, but knew it wouldn't be enough to convey the potential of the High Line to the scores of people who would still need convincing. And so we contacted this photographer, this famous photographer named Joel Sternfeld. We took him up. He said, don't let any other photographer up here for a year, and I'll give you exactly what you want. So he went up there for a year, all different seasons, all different kind, times of day, and brought back these photos that are what, what really drove our um, project for a long time. Because instead of, we learned to speak less and show the photos more because people could envision different things up there. You know, some people envisioned it as, you know, about the wildflowers, about this native landscape. Some people saw it um, as a place for architecture. Some people saw it um, about rail history. Some people just saw it as open space. Some people saw it as a park. Some people saw it as a thing for light rail. Because Josh and I always said, we're, we're not gonna decide what goes up there. The public should really decide. And we did dozens of community input. And if I could summarize all of that, it was, it was we, we liked the Joel Sternfeld photos. We liked this wild landscape. And soon, support for turning the High Line into a large-scale landscape project started picking up steam. The city administration revoked the demolition order and even gave the first chunk of capital funding for the saving of the High Line. And after a full-fledged design competition, a team was chosen for the job. CSX Transportation officially donated the mile and a half structure to the city. Work crews broke ground in early 2006, and slowly, a transformation began to take shape. It wasn't like a slavish recreation of exactly what, what was there, because that was one way to do it. Okay, you like the Joel Stonefield photos, we're gonna remove everything and just try to put it back, you know, try to recreate it, sort of this Disney version of what was there. But I think what the design team got was, that's not the spirit of the High Line. This, the, the High Line wasn't meant to look like that wildscape, it was meant to look like a railroad, you know, where they sprayed with pesticides and nothing was supposed to grow on it. They got you needed to build something new, but it needed to reference the past. And there's a great quote in a book called The Leopard, um, and I just happened to be reading it during the competition, that said, for everything to stay the same, everything has to change. And I really thought they got that. The landscape architecture firm was New York-based James Cornerfield Operations. The architects, Diller, Scofidio, and Renfro, both are heavy hitters in the innovative urban design movement today. But according to Hammond, were relatively newcomers at the time, with an approach that gave the abandoned railway the look and feel of a modern park that used to be a railway. It had this planking system that evoked that linear feeling, but it was also rough, it was just concrete, that feathered into the landscape. So it also, the planting could grow up in between the planks and it could feel like nature sort of taking over that man-made environment. Garden design fell to renowned Dutch nurseryman Piet Udolf, and the plant palette he chose turned out to be the magical final ingredient. And then this landscape that Piet um, and James Corner came up with that is inspired by what was there, but completely different on the other hand. You know, I asked Pete, is this a wild landscape? And he said, there's nothing wild about it. This is idealized nature. The first of the High Line sections opened to the public in 2009. The second opened two years later. The third section opened in 2014. 
Andy Pettis is the director of horticulture, and that idealized nature is now her responsibility. The plantings on the High Line are really meant to evoke what was growing here spontaneously when the railroad was in disuse. Um, we have about 500 species and cultivars of, of plants growing on the High Line, 1,200 trees, about 110,000 perennials altogether. Uh, it's, a, it's a lot of diversity, as you're saying. They, I think there is a misconception that all of the plants are native or that they were all growing here on their own and, and we just used those same plants. Um, that's, that's not true. We, when the park was under construction, we had to strip everything off, including the soil, um, to do a lot of remediation. Uh, there was lead paint, there was asbestos, there, who knows what the railroad had been spraying on the soils for years to keep weeds down and prevent track fires. Uh, so we had to abate all of that. Um, we brought in new soil and, and, and all of these beautiful plantings. Um, it's a very cosmopolitan plant design. It's about half native plants, native to the United States. Um, about 30% of all of the plants growing here on the High Line are native to the Northeast. Um, and the rest are introduced species. And as gardeners here, our, our sort of mission is to maintain the integrity of those designs. They're very dynamic designs. There are a lot of plants in this design that self-sow, uh, so they kind of migrate and find their way to where they want to be. And we edit that process a little bit. We'll take seedlings out of, from over here and maybe transplant them over here. So we're looking for proportion and balance aesthetically in the gardens. But being suspended above ground, the High Line faces challenges that just don't come into play in other gardens. It is a very unique place to be cultivating plants. Some of the challenges the horticulturists face here on the High Line are really high winds off the Hudson River. Um, we're 30 feet up in the air and so we're very exposed to the elements. Um, it's at any time, it's five to 10 degrees colder or five to 10 degrees warmer than it is at street level. So we deal with that a lot, um, kind of severe temperatures. We're basically a bridge, so the soil freezes from above and below, uh, and we get a lot of uh, heaving in the winter time and root damage, so that can be a real issue. And remember, this is the city that never sleeps, a city that is still growing all the time and in every direction. In New York, you may have the perfect location, but you're always affected by what your neighbors are doing. There's a ton of construction happening along the High Line right now, and so new high-rises are plunging areas of the garden that were designed for full sun into full shade. Um, and we're seeing new wind corridors and new precipitation shadows and all of that is affecting the kinds of plants we can grow in different areas along the High Line. So we're having to sort of think about that um, and, and try to predict what, how the gardens are going to succeed, so to speak, um, as an ecological process. And, and that's really how we'll think about it when we're changing the plant palette up is, you know, if if this was a tree canopy growing up rather than a high rise, what are the kinds of plants that would fill these niches in, in our garden in this landscape? So we'll think about the kinds of shade plants that might find their way in, um, understory trees, those kinds of things. Walking up and down the High Line, you never forget, you're in the middle of New York City. And that was a deliberate choice by the design team. But what is easy to forget is that you're not on solid ground. In fact, this is one big giant green roof. And as a gardener, as I look at all these lush plantings and some big trees and shrubs, I can't help but wonder about the planting mix that goes into making up the health of all of these plants. The soils are about 18 inches deep on average, although some of the areas are as little as nine inches of soil. Um, some of the places where our larger trees are growing, we are mounded up or, or in planters, so it's a little deeper than that, 36 to 48 inches. But for the most part, we're, we're working with very little soil. 
The soil on the High Line was uh, very carefully manufactured to be quickly draining. Um, we are essentially a giant window box, uh, so we, we need to make sure that the moisture levels in the soil are, are carefully regulated so that we don't drown any of the plants and it dries out very, very quickly in the summertime especially. One of the biggest challenges we face on the High Line is that there's just no space. We don't have a lot of room for composting, so we have been very creative in coming up with solutions as to how to, to do this. And one of the ways we did it was we started a, a static aerated system. So we converted one of our bin systems to a static aerated composting system, which basically means we um, put perforated pipe up through the middle of the bin and we force air through it. And that just uh, keeps the, the pile aerated so that we don't have to spend as much labor turning the compost. And it also speeds up the, the natural processes that decay and make that happen. Still very labor intensive. Most recently, we were able to purchase a, an in-vessel composting machine called the Rockets. Uh, and basically, it's this giant cylinder and literally the, the plant material goes in one side. There's an auger that is just constantly turning and turning and turning and two weeks later compost comes out the other side. It's really remarkable and it has definitely sped up our compost. And this year we expect that we will be able to compost 100% of the material we take out of the, the beds on site uh, and compost it right here and put it right back into the garden. So we're very excited about that. And the High Line's commitment to environmental stewardship doesn't end with their composting efforts. Andy's staff doesn't use chemicals in the gardens, not even chemical fertilizers. And when it comes to maintaining the mile and a half long garden, well, it turns out in the most populated city in the country, there's no shortage of willing gardeners. You know, the great thing about horticulture in Manhattan and, and working at a public garden in Manhattan is that people don't often have a lot of their own green space or outdoor space, so they're really itching to get their hands in the soil. Um, so we're really lucky to have some very excited volunteers. In March every year, we do all of our cutting back of the, the you know, last year's growth in the gardens. And the first year we, we opened, we knew that we wouldn't be able to, to use machines to do that. For one thing, we have this, um, you know, this, this gravel mulch, which is meant to evoke uh, railroad ballast. Um, but it means that we can't mow in the gardens. We can't use weed trimmers, uh, string trimmers in the gardens to, to do any of that cutting back. We decided to do it all by hand using shears and pruners. And we brought on this army of volunteers to help us. Uh, so we have anywhere between 100 and 300 volunteers who come throughout the month of March to help us cut back all of the perennials and herbaceous plants in the garden. Um, and it's become a real event every year. It's sort of the, the first big thing we get to do in the park and it sort of opens the season for us. People come back year after year and, and we all look forward to cut back, spring cut back on the High Line every year. So it's really become this sort of community event. People ask me all the time, what are my favorite plants? And it's like asking a mother, which is your favorite child? Um, I, they're all my favorites. And in different times of the year. So uh, for instance, in the springtime, one of my favorite places on the High Line right now is just north of us, um, the Washington grasslands, where we have some catmints and, and grasses and sort of lots of meadow plants growing up. And at this point, they're, there are these beautiful undulating green, it's almost like a topography. And then later in the summer, uh, probably one of my favorite places on the High Line is the Lisa Marie Falcon flyover, which is uh, an area of the High Line that sort of peels up from the structure itself and is a canopy walk. So you actually walk through a canopy of big leaf magnolias. It feels very sort of prehistoric to be walking through there. And of course, um, it's nice and shady, and so it feels very cool and, and comfortable in the, in the middle, middle of the summer. In the fall, my favorite place on the High Line is definitely the Chelsea Grasslands between 18th and 20th Streets. 
little blue stems and switch grasses and prairie drop seeds and big blue stem and, and other grasses that are native to the prairie state. So it really feels like a, a, a prairie or a meadow. Winter on the High Line is a really magical experience, especially under a fresh snowfall. We don't cut any of the perennials or herbaceous plants back until March. So all of the seed heads and the, the sort of mounding grasses and all of that structure of what we like to call the skeletons of the plants are persistent in the winter gardens. The High Line is really beautiful throughout the seasons and it was very intentionally designed that way. A lot of people think of the High Line as this design project, but in a lot of ways it's a plant project. <laughs> because it's, and, and even people that don't appreciate the planting, um, what I don't think they realize is it's changing their whole experience. Um, we, we have a, a, a little shop on the High Line where we sell High Line t-shirts. And I talked to someone that worked in our store and she's worked in retail her whole life. She said it's like clockwork that a few times a week a customer would freak out and scream at her and just ha you know blow up. When she worked on the High Line, it only happened once a month. And she said it's not the merchandise. It's that they're not, you know, in a fluorescent lit store. They're in nature. They feel different. They're in a different, it changes. And now the science is backing up. It literally changes their chemistry. You know, it literally makes you physically, scientifically healthier. That's why I think for a lot of people, it feels very much like New York because it has a little bit of, of, of the grit of the city. You know, you're, you're seeing parts of the city, but you're also in this natural environment. I think the thing that surprised me the most is that this thing worked at all. Would anyone come? Did anyone want to walk three flights up a set of stairs? Would the plants live in just several inches of soil, you know, that's on, on a bridge that's going to fry in the summer and freeze in the winter? Um, would people throw things off? Um, would it be dangerous? And I knew the first day it opened, I realized it was better because of the people. Now, one of the things, partly it's the landscape, the planting, but it's also the people that make it special. It's the combination. It's not, it's not just the planting, it's, it's both together that really animate the space. Because I think a lot of what it's about is people watching and having these interactions, you know, with um, people. And so, you know, it's so far beyond what we ever expected. You want to talk about exceeding expectations? When the High Line was first set to open, Robert estimated they'd get about 300,000 visitors. They caught a million. And last year, seven and a half million people visited this place. That's more than the Metropolitan Museum or the Museum of Natural History. It really is an incredible place. Whether you come to check out the amazing flowers or the awesome art or simply people watch, it's very apparent that the High Line has weaved its way into the cultural fabric of Manhattan's west side. And while it's safe to say that even though no one quite knew what to do with this place over the 20 years it stayed vacant, New Yorkers can't imagine this place without the High Line today. And there's a lot to learn about the High Line, including the spark that it lit to ignite green urban development all over the U.S. and beyond. And we have that information on our website under the show notes for this episode. And the website address, that's the same as our show name. It's growingagreenerworld.com. Thanks for joining us, everybody. I'm Joe Lample, and we'll see you back here next time for more Growing a Greener World.